This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Your discretion is advised. Bat. Bat. Ah! Who, what, where, when, why? It's about time you woke up. You were dreaming again, weren't you? No! Yes. What's all the yelling about, Zack? I caught Matt here snoozing and dreaming once more. About a certain sterling single, that is. Really? Well, good for him. Now come on, it's time for our next video. It's my turn to pick the topic, Mike. Remembered that you said you would allow me to pick the next episode's topic after you made me sing Canada's National Anthem when we talked about Series 12 of Thomas and Friends. And it's been long enough as it is. Oh yeah, I did. Thanks for reminding me. I mean, it was either that or a cup of Tim Horton's coffee, so... So, what's it gonna be, Matt? Today's topic, my friends, and Zach, is going to be about Emily. Namely, about her first appearance and roles in Series 7, the controversy regarding her being promoted to a main character in Series 8, her not-so-good change in personality beginning in the same season, the whole Duck versus Emily thing, Emily becoming the Railway's official number 12, you name it. Why am I not surprised? Is there something wrong with my topic idea? No, not at all. Then it's decided. We're talking about Emily. So, who's gonna host this one exactly? Well, I know for sure that I won't be partaking in this one. What?! But didn't you mention to me that you had a ton you wanted to say about her? I did, but plans do change. As a matter of fact, and I was planning on telling all four of you anyway, I don't want to partake in any more discussions about the little blue tank engine. But... But why, Zach? What made you come up with this decision? <sighs> Look, it's been on my mind since we did the review on Tatmar for episode 13, but after finishing episode of Rama, I decided I don't want to be perceived as just a Thomas reviewer. They know the fact that while not all fans are bad, a good majority of the Thomas fandom is a dumpster fire that's absolute worst. But what can I add to any discussion Thomas related apart from so what and oh yeah? I've had much more enjoyment working on the review for My Little Pony A New Generation, as well as comparing and contrasting Friendship is Magic to DC Superhero Girls than I could any future Thomas discussion I'd partake in. There's only so many times I can put up with fans trying to call Thomas morbid a kid show, which, quite frankly, is less expressing their love for the franchise and more preaching to the choir and refusing to shut the hell up about this mentality that was established after Audrey died in 1997 and Allcroft sold out with the most overrated season of the show the following year and then a massive box office failure two years after that. But I digress. The point is, I'm nearing my 30s and I want to branch out as a reviewer. And if it means having to abandon my roots that have been in place since I was a very small boy, then so be it. Thomas is not a franchise that's popular to the same level as Harry Potter, Star Wars, or Lord of the Rings. Basically, Thomas is something you either like or you don't. And no one might have arguing that the sad story of Henry actually has a part two detailing the lore behind Soda Island or what the ten quintessential episodes are will ever convince Joe Public that Thomas is, and always has been a franchise aimed at children aged between two and five. If a documentary about the fandom that's been three years delayed won't do it, then who, much less any of us, can? I completely understand where you're coming from, Zach. And believe it or not, I've been feeling the same way for a couple of years now. Sure, Thomas has always held a special place in my heart from the time I was a boy, particularly the Shining Time Station era in seasons one through four, but I just don't feel the same energy about reviewing as I did five years ago. Not just with Thomas, but reviewing in general. Um, where are you going with this, Mike? Yeah, what's going on here? Well, I'm sorry to say that I won't be taking part in this review either, because I'm retiring from the emotions corner. WHAT?! WHY ARE YOU RETIRING?! We just talked about both My Little Pony G4 and DC Superhero Girls G4 in the previous review! So why didn't you tell us then?! The both of you along with Matt also covered Series 12 of Thomas the first time around without me, and Matt and I talked about Villain Redemptions in Episode 7, yet no one had any problems with it then. FYI, Zack, the only reason you didn't partake in the Series 12 review was because you were taking care of Rachel after I had burned her by mistake. And I apologized for that! That's funny, because I don't recall you apologizing to me after I was burned just before episode 7. That was an accident! An accident? Really? And I suppose your spots of anger are also accidents. Then again, considering which emotion you represent, that makes a lot of sense. How many times do I have to say it? it Zach, how come you haven't reacted accident. to Mike's retirement? Never mind. Actually, I was told about this beforehand. You mean, you knew this whole time? 
And you chose uh, my, not to say anything. Do you think anything? now would be a good time to get the F U asterisk K out of here before things get ugly? Good idea. I'll be back after the review's over. What Stay the- tuned, hey, folks. Get back here! I'm not done with you two! <sighs> Just let it go, Matt. Let it go. Yeah, what she said. And besides, we should get started with this review anyway. I suppose. But you know, it really won't be the same without Mike. Who are we gonna get to fill his place? I'll get it. <laughs> Hey guys! Oh hi James, what brings you down here? Zach called and said it was my turn to bring the board games for game night. Anyone a fan of 13 Dead and Drive? Game night will have to wait. Right now, we have a review to start. Ooh, a new review? What's this one about? It's supposed to be a review about Emily. Zach and Mike aren't helping with this one. That means it's just me, Matt, and Rachel. Hey, why don't you help us, James? Me? Help with a review? Why not? You've helped Zach and I with our stories before. And you've been co-writing with me and Aaron on Yu-Gi-Oh! The Sodar Chronicles. For any Yu-Gi-Oh! fans out there who are interested, though a fair disclaimer warning, many chapters, especially the later ones, contain increasingly dark and mature elements that are not suited for young readers. In fact, this series is more for older readers. And speaking of Emily, you have helped me with making her saga for my Thomas AU a while ago, and we can still brainstorm more ideas for Flash Sentry and the Ink Demon in future if you'd like. Isn't it usually just three people doing a review at a time? Normally, that's the case, but sometimes we do make exceptions depending on the topic. Hmm. Okay, I'll give it a shot. In that case, welcome aboard, James! Alright! There's no one quite like Emily. Starting out in Series 7 as one of the first female steam engines in the TV series, Emily's left her mark on the fandom. Though in later years, that mark became a rather bad omen. Her overall time on the show has become a rather controversial one, since some people liked her because she was very special and unique in the Thomas the Tank Engine series, and others don't like her because how much she changed over time in both good ways and bad. Regardless of her personality, there have been many fan arts or stories relating to our friendly Emerald. Many of them are retellings of her previous adventures, and others are brand new and show her in a more positive light than how she was first experienced. And as for the way she was handled throughout the show's runtime, imagine it as taking a ball of round, smooth cookie dough, then having that dough run over with a spiked bat instead of a flat rolling pin. But instead of having a batch of ruined cookies... You manage to find a sheet of fresh, tasty chocolate chip donuts. Mmm, donuts. So, are the criticisms about Emily justified, or was she simply misunderstood, as her song explains? Sometimes she can't help herself and gets misunderstood. Things can sometimes turn out wrong when all she meant was good. Today, we're going to dig deep and find the answer. The engine was beautiful, with shiny paintwork and a gleaming brass dome. The first episode Emily appears in is, quite appropriately named, Emily's New Coaches, one of the first episodes of Series 7. Thomas first meets her at Napford Station, and it's love at first sight between them. Just kidding, there's none of that stuff in the show. Anyway, the Fat Controller sends Emily off to collect some coaches, which turn out to be Annie and Clarabelle, much to Thomas's anger. A few of the other engines do not act kindly towards her, which makes her feel sad. Thomas, meanwhile, is instructed by the Fat Controller to go to Brendam Docks to collect some coaches that have arrived. Thomas doesn't want to do that job, but, as the Fat Controller often says, Really useful engines don't argue. When Emily returns to the yard, Oliver firmly explains that Annie and Clarabelle belong to Thomas, and Emily leaves to find Thomas and apologize to him for unintentionally upsetting him. Later at a signal box, there's trouble. Oliver is stuck on an intersection, having broken down, and Thomas is heading towards him. Luckily, Emily manages to push Oliver to safety just in time, preventing a serious accident. The Fat Controller is very proud of Emily for her quick thinking and rewards her with the two coaches that Thomas collected from the docks. 
So yeah, I think Emily made a very good first impression in her first episode. Honestly, back when I was young and heard rumours about season 7 introducing new characters which consisted of Murdoch, Emily, Spencer, Arthur and Fergus, I was quite excited to see them until I came across her debut episode. That was one of the episodes of season 7 that I enjoyed the most, even more so when she also helped Henry in another episode of the same season, What's the Matter with Henry? But apart from having major roles in those two episodes, she also made smaller appearances in a few others like Salty Stormy Tail and Bulgy Rides Again, where in the former she is kind to Salty and tells Thomas and Percy both off for hurting Salty's feelings. For a new character, she has certainly made a huge impact not just to everyone on Sodor, but for the fan community as well, and I personally think she's got good character development building up. Until it's all derailed in the next season, but more on that later. I always like the idea of another female character coming to the show. Until I saw Daisy and Mavis on VHS reruns of Shining Time Station on TV, I always was a bit puzzled as to why there were more male engines than females. I mean, they had female coaches, but why not female engines too? And after Lady's debut in Thomas and the Magic Railroad, part of me had hoped that she would stay on the show. But, as Hit was too lazy to use her as more of a character, Emily became my new beacon of hope. I do have one criticism for this episode, and it's that the Fat Controller did not consider Thomas's feelings when he had to pick up new coaches. I mean, Thomas had any Clarabelle for years. Of course he'd be upset if they were in the buffers of another engine, especially without said engine's permission. Yes, everyone, even the Fat Controller, makes poor judgments. Though I wonder if he knew it was Annie and Clarabelle Emily took or not. Even so, the Fat Controller should have assured Thomas that these new coaches were not going to replace Annie and Clarabelle. Smooth move there, Topham. Would it kill you to stop and take your engine's feelings into consideration for once in your life? And I know this thing with Emily is controversial, but I think Duck should have been in place of Emily in Bulgy Rides again. The same thing with Oliver replacing Thomas, by the way. Remind me, which of these four engines have had a history of Bulgy and which of them have not? Very true. It would have been very entertaining to see Duck and Oliver butt heads with Bulgy again after the latter was out of service for so long. <sighs> Such a wasted opportunity. Series 7, overall, handled Emily splendidly. Sure, fan reception to her was initially a bit mixed, but I believe it was more on the positive side. I really enjoyed the episodes that featured her, main role or not, and they're among some of my favorites overall. However... That wasn't to last, I'm afraid, because she goes downhill, beginning with... Series 8, where the cast of characters gets a major shakeup, with a core team of eight main characters being selected to lead the series. We have Thomas, Edward, Henry, Gordon, James, Percy, Toby, and... Emily. Originally, Duck was supposed to be part of the so-called Steam Team, but the need for a main female character resulted in Duck getting the boot, and Emily taking the spot, which made her go from mildly well-received to negatively received by older fans. To make matters worse for her, Emily's personality was drastically overhauled, going from a kind, helpful engine to a bossy, nagging bitch. Episodes featuring her with that persona, combined with the brewing controversy of her stealing Duck's spotlight, made Emily the most hated main character by fans for a really long time, and this stigma would be stuck with her until at least Series 17. But that's not what we're talking about yet. Nope. We're talking about Series 8 through 12, Emily, and the episodes featuring her. We begin with Thomas, Emily, and the... Snowplow! Infamous for being one of the first episodes to showcase Emily's new persona. Um, why did you whisper when you said... Shh! Don't say that word! It's a bad word! Since when was snowplow meant to be a bad word? Not the whole word, just the first part of it. Wait a sec. You're saying snow is a bad word? That's so stupid! Zack and I say lots of bad words sometimes, mainly when we argue with each other. Yeah, but this four-letter word is much more evil than all of your usual strong banter words put together, especially when you have all that stuff outside in winter causing roadblocks and making everything cold. Ah, that's a good point. My uncle and I have been at the driveway several times already. <laughs> say, think you can remind us what that word is we're not supposed to say, James? What is it now? Soap? Soap's not a bad word. It helps hmm. you get clean. No, no. I think that bad word was soda, right? How could something that delicious be a bad word? 
Well, it is bad for your teeth if you don't brush. No, you're both wrong. The word he's talking about is clearly shoe. No, 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 it's snow. Not soap, not soda, and not shoe. It's snow. Whiter than flour and chrysalis' is non-existent heart. Don't! <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we are all amused, here's Thomas, Emily, and the snowplow. See, Emily has started telling Thomas how he is or isn't supposed to do his jobs, which makes our blue tang engine rather annoyed. I can get with what Emily was thinking, though. She feels that Thomas has the potential to do better than he's already doing, and she wants to help prove that he can surpass his limitations. And in her mind, the best way to help Thomas is to tell him how, in her eyes, he should be working better. This, and many more of Emily's mishaps in the hit era, comes off more or less as a classic case of good intentions, poor execution. Little does she realize, though, that her bossing Thomas around is only bringing trouble. Things come to a turn when Sir Topham Hatt orders Emily to tell Thomas that he is to have his snowplow fitted for an oncoming snowstorm. But Thomas, thinking that Emily's just making excuses to tell him what to do again, ignores her and winds up stuck in a snowdrift. Emily comes to his aid and scolds him for her not listening, again not realizing that he ignored her in the first place due to her bossiness. And it leads to the first of many of Emily's most infamous lines in this dark era being said. I am sorry, said Emily. Sorry you didn't listen to me. Uh, James, maybe you should continue talking before Matt blows up. Good idea. Later, when Thomas is getting scolded for not obeying Sir Topham Hatt's orders, Emily finally realizes that she forgot to tell Thomas it was Sir Topham Hatt who wanted him to wear his plow in the first place. She owns up to the misunderstanding, and both engines become good friends again. This episode was the beginning of Emily's descent into hit-related madness. Any thoughts on this? Well, to be honest, I kind of say it was Emily's fault for provoking Thomas into not listening to her in the first place. Since when she started becoming so aggressively bossy and rude, even without realizing she was hurting her friend's feelings. Whatever happens to the warm, friendly Emerald Emily that we've grown accustomed to back in Season 7? That's what fanfics and theory videos are for. One series of fanfics, however, reveals that the reason for Emily's change in behavior between Season 7 and 8 was because she was being bullied and was too afraid to say anything. Yeah, I just think that's a flimsy excuse for the series to work. Fair point. And it doesn't get any better from there. The next episode we've come to is easily the most infamous of Emily with her new persona, and it's called Emily's Adventure. And if you all thought Thomas Emily in the snowplow was terrible, this shitstorm of an episode is just as friggin' bad! It makes me want to- Let's just handle this explanation, that way you don't blow a gasket. But you'll blow a gasket at some point anyway. But at least this way the blow will be slightly cushioned until a later time. Say, we haven't got any tranquilizer darts around here, have we? Sorry, James, we do not use tranquilizers. You're no think we'd fun. get in trouble if we did. Anywho, on to Emily's adventure. In this episode, a nasty storm sweeps across Sodor, causing lots of damage and blowing off the roof on Farmer McColl's barn. And without a proper roof over their heads, his cows and their calves would end up getting cold at night. So the Fat Controller gives Emily the task of bringing timber to the barn so the roof can be fixed. And that's where it gets bad. Really, really bad. Emily starts bossing the workmen and Trevor about just so they can get the lines cleared faster. While this makes them angry, Emily takes no notice. That is, until she comes across Elizabeth pushing a fallen water tower off the line. And after Emily tries ordering her about too, Elizabeth shows she has no tolerance for such behavior and deliberately goes slower and slower. And it isn't until Thomas shows up and calls Emily out that she realize what she's doing is wrong. And it eventually leads to an infamous line from the narrator. Emily didn't like being called a bossy boiler, and she didn't want to ask nicely. Why do I have the feeling there's gonna be a storm? <sighs> Three, two, one... That right there is crossing the fucking line! It means that, yes, Emily was fully aware she was being horrible to everyone else, deliberately, preferring to boss everyone around. It's fucking bullshit writing! And you know what? The fact Thomas told her straight up she was being a bossy boiler got her upset is so damn absurd, seeing as she was having a blast being a total bitch towards others and had no intention of stopping. And we also can't forget she was already kind and mature enough in Series 7 to know her manners, but only seemed to use the here because shit someone else had to spend 
spell it out for her in order to make her do it. And also because she shouldn't even need to learn such a lesson in the first place for reasons I already mentioned. To make matters worse, I heard that deleted scenes would have had Emily forgetting her learned lesson at the very end, making the whole moral of the episode all for fucking nothing! WHAT THE FUCKING HELL WAS THE POINT OF IT ALL?! Fucking bullshit writing! FUCKING BULLSHIT WRITING! FUCKING BULLSHIT WRITING! Easy there, Matt. Easy there. Whoa. Where'd all that come from? Sorry about that, but when you've seen Emily's behavior so many times in the hit era, wouldn't you feel the same way? Maybe, but that's not how I see her acting. Let's take a brief look at this ordeal from Emily's point of view. Now, what was her main focus throughout this episode? Bringing Farmer McColl the timber he needs to repair his barn roof. Why? So his calves don't freeze at night. That right there indicates that Emily is clearly an animal lover, and her concern for those little calves has become her top priority. So much so that she unintentionally defies common sense and attempts to push everyone around her in order to work harder so that those cows don't freeze and get sick. And I can kind of relate there that aspect. As a cat lover, the moment anything were to happen involving my fur babies, there is a high possibility that I would be just as bossy and impatient to anyone who stood between me and helping them. So Emily's not being bossy for the sake of being mean. She's just doing what she feels is necessary to help animals in need. You know, James makes an interesting point on that. As for that deleted scene at the end, the writers probably realized this would annoy people seeing her act the way she was at the end. Anyway, as Matt so kindly pointed out to us in his profanity-laced rant, Emily apologizes to Elizabeth, and this time asks her politely to clear the line. And to her surprise, Elizabeth actually agrees to help this time. With this in mind, Emily spends the rest of her journey asking others to politely get her path clear until she finally reaches Farmer McColl's farm. The barn gets fixed up, and Emily is thanked for making it in time. And that was Emily's adventure. Aside from Matt's outbursts, what did the rest of you think? Well, since this was just another episode of Emily acting so bossy and rude without even realizing it's hurting her friend's feelings, I got nothing else to say since both you and Matt already covered it up. But I would say that this brings up another bad episode of Emily's, and it's called As Good As Gordon. Jesus Christ. God damn it. You just had to mention it, Cam. Sorry, Matt. We've already gotten a few bad Emily episodes up at this point. I guess it's worth mentioning it before we bury it under the hatch for good. But if it makes you feel any better, Matt, I also hate that episode just as much as you do. There are many reasons to hate it. And what better way to tell you why than with another of Emily's most infamous quotes from series 8 through 12, this time from the episode in question. Hurry up, slow coach, she cried. Oh, you will make me late. You know, personally in my opinion, if they hadn't thrown Daisy away from the series until she made her return in Calling All Engines, I'd say she would fit the role of Emily instead. A planned rewrite is in order, I'd say. Makes sense, right? Given her highly sprung and right up to date attitude. That is, unless Daisy refused to suit to such a law as, in her eyes, manual labor. While Emily was more than willing to actually do the work she was given despite her attitude, Daisy would have likely tried to con one of the other engines into doing the more heavier, dirtier work, just so she can keep her looks up. Can you imagine how it would have gone if Daisy had been in this episode? What? Me? Pulling a train? I understand passengers come first, but when you're suggesting is manual labor, how am I supposed to keep up appearances if they get spoiled for me overworking myself? It's fitter's orders. Daisy, you've been pulling this stunt since series two. As far as we're concerned, your fitter's nothing more than your imaginary friend you made up to avoid doing jobs you don't want to do. Actually, my fitter is very real, and he's standing right behind you. <clears throat> um, oh, uh, oh, dear. <laughs> Told ya. Oh, from the rail car and the coaches. Right. If we could get back to the episode, please. <clears throat> Once again, Emily is a bitch towards nearly everyone she comes across, just so she can prove she can pull the express as well as Gordon. Doesn't help that the free strikes formula is in this episode, making it even worse! A fair point in that aspect. But again, let's look at it from Emily's side of the story. When Gordon argues that Emily could never do as good of a job on the express as he does, it almost like he sounds like he's insinuating that's because she's much older than him. I'm the best at pulling the express because I'm strong and amazing. You're just an old-fashioned engine. And as we all know, old-fashioned engines aren't as reliable as modern ones. And blah, 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 blah. See what I'm getting at here? 
And besides, it's noted that Emily's class used to be in express engines, so this would account for Emily feeling so overconfident herself that she could handle the express. True, she had many mishaps over her journey, but that's what happens when we let pride clutter our judgments. And in Emily's case, that pride stemmed from trying to prove to Gordon that an old-fashioned engine could handle a job just as well as a modern one could. Well, I personally see Gordon and Emily's relationship being more positive than that. Gordon actually has a lot of respect for Emily because of her being an older express engine for the GNR. And their spick and span, which gave Emily a villain role alongside Gordon and James. And, like the last few episodes, she says at one point an infamous quote, to my utter dismay. There's no need for you to get clean, said Emily. James, Cam, Rach... Please, someone say something about the episode before I lose my mind. Already on it. Yes, Emily seemed rather arrogant about the contest, but I wouldn't say it was very villainy, because what has she done other than insist that she'd be the grandest due to her figure? Nothing. She doesn't purposely get the other engines dirty. She doesn't say anything hurtful to them other than that one instant. So from my point of view, she was merely getting cocky and overconfident, possibly due to a compliment a visiting passenger made regarding her as a very rare and unique engine. And as we all know, too much praise can make one have a very overinflated opinion of themselves. Though I think we can all agree that if Daisy had been in this role instead, it would have been a better suited. Am I right? Yes! Thank you! I've been saying that Daisy would definitely replace Emily's bad roles in those episodes because of her highly sprung and right up to date attitude of hers. But of course, they threw that kind of potential out the window as well as the character herself. And had Frankie been introduced back in this era, those bad roles could have also fit her as well. Perhaps in an alternate reality of Sodor, things could have been a bit different. Well, diesel railcars don't have as much pulling power as other engines. It's even implied in Daisy's self-titled story she would struggle with a lot of trucks. And as for Frankie, she's too evil to be part of the Northwestern Railway. It's only a suggestion, Rachel. We all know Emily is not that stubborn like Daisy in some aspects, nor is she evil like Frankie. Thanks to those episodes and more, Emily, as I mentioned, became the most hated of the main characters for a long, long time. But were all of her series 8 episodes outright shit? Not necessarily. There are episodes in this season where she is better written, and we'll start with Emily's new route. Basically, so Topham Hat assigns Emily to run the flour mill special, delivering flour so fresh bread can be made. As Emily tells this to James, he warns her that he has to take the, apparently infamous, Black Lock Run. He tells her of a monster that lurks in the waters, making Emily rather uneasy. She tries to go about her dear liveries properly, but the trucks cause her grief, make her late, and for no reason at all, Emily is the one who gets blamed. That's one thing I don't understand. Why is it that the engines get punished for the incidents and the trucks get off scot-free? Haven't the engines ever called Sir Topham out on that? You know, sir, have you ever stopped to think that perhaps many of the accidents we engines get into are caused by those troublesome trucks you can't employed? Maybe if you discipline them instead of us, they would stop causing so much trouble. Oh, uh, well, I am. Um, uh, you may have a point there, Emily. I may need to look into that. Thank you, sir. Anyway, Sir Topham Hat warns Emily that she'll be put on the black lock run in James' place if she can't shape up. Next day, Emily tries to do better, but only delivers half the flour. As she tries to reclaim the other half, the trucks tease her so much that Emily loses her cool and accidentally pushes the trucks into the pond. After she gets fished out, Emily finds herself being sent to the black lock run, despite Thomas insisting that it'll be pretty nice. The next morning, Emily takes her first passenger run up to the lock, when she gets blocked by a landslide. As they wait for help, Emily's fears become realized when she sees something moving in the water, thinking it's the monster James warned her about. But to her relief... It's a family of seals! That's right! The monster is nothing more than a family of friendly seals. With her fears gone, Emily now finds the Black Lock Run most enjoyable, and even invites Thomas to see the seals too. Another episode where Emily is written with positive manners is Chickens to School. While she only appears in one scene, it still shows her being a well-meaning engine. When Thomas gets his jobs mixed up because of how tired he is, Emily voices her concern for him and even offers to give him some help. But there is one more good role that Emily has had in the season, which is the episode Halloween. Before we go into her character development in this episode, it's worth mentioning to say that I freaking love this episode because of the spooky atmosphere it plays into the episode. Despite that brief scene of that scrap engine we saw at the beginning, which is one of my favourite parts, but that chase sequence where Emily was covered in some white tarpaulin and chased Thomas, Ari and Bird down the line back to Tidmouth Sheds. It is a relief to see that Emily didn't stoop to her 
her rude bossiness again in this episode this time around, and instead, Ari and Bert were given the blame in the end. About time too! But in the end, out of all the episodes of season 8 I watched, I still think Halloween is my most favourite out of all of them. There, you see, Matt? Not every episode Emily is in series 8 was bad. <sighs> I suppose. But it still doesn't change my opinion that Emily was horrible in series 8. Don't worry, we won't hold it against you. Sadly, she doesn't get any better than calling all engines, nor in series 9 through 12. Ugh, now you've gone and done it, James. What? All I mentioned was calling all engines in season 9 through 12. And now you will never move out of my shed, huffed Emily. <laughs> I take it he hates a special? <sighs> like you wouldn't believe. The only one who hates more is Mr. on Rescue. He's not the only one, Rachel. We all do. Although, Zack hates Day of the Diesels and The Great Race even more. And a certain box office train wreck that shall not be named. Should have known. Say, isn't Misty Island Rescue the one where Dr. Seuss invaded Sodor and some hillbilly engines tried to throw logs at Thomas? Never mind, I remember now, and it isn't pretty. Anyway, Emily isn't exactly at her nicest in Kong All Engines. She doesn't treat Thomas very well when the Timothy Sheds is down for remodeling, and the engines have to scatter to find other places to spend the night. Thomas ends up with Emily at Knapford Sheds, and if it wasn't obvious, she's not a big fan of having a roommate. Throughout most of Series 8, the only times Emily was seen at the Timothy Sheds with the others is when there's a meeting involved. She was never actually shown sleeping beside any of them. And while Tidmouth Sheds has mainly been used as a carriage shed, Emily has used it as her perfect shed for some peace and quiet. And now, having that peace and quiet disturbed, I can share her frustration. There are times when I want some peace and quiet, only for it to be disturbed by work or family. For Emily's actions here, it can be believed that she suffers from a slight OCD issue. But when Thomas doesn't come back one night, Emily feels a slight relief that peace has returned. But at a cost. But without Thomas, it seemed a little too quiet. She missed hearing all about the day. She even missed the sound of Thomas's sleep whistle. That's right. Emily had become so used to having a roommate that going back to her solitary lifestyle seems a bit more lonely, and it makes her realize how unfair she had been. You guys remember how Lady visited Thomas's dream and Tom how all engines should work together? I remember it. Pity we didn't see Duck in this special. It would have been fun to see him and Diesel working together. Hey, there's an idea. Have Duck be the one to convince Diesel to work at the airport and of the whole Thomas and Diesel tend debacle. That would have made things way more interesting. Plus, I'd like to imagine that if Kong all engines were made a bit longer, Emily herself could have had a visit from Lady in her own dream that night. And in that dream, Lady scolds Emily for her selfish attitude and for making Percy feel so unwelcome. Ashamed over her actions earlier on, Emily would insist that she didn't mean to hurt Thomas, but Lady still reminds her that we often hurt others when we don't think about their feelings. Oh, that'd be wonderful to see. But in the end, Emily was made welcome to the newly rebuilt Tidmouth Sheds when Percy points it out that the shed now has a seventh berth for her to stay in. So I guess all good things came out well for her in the end. Waiting for passengers is boring, huffed Emily. Then she remembered that Toby and Percy were working near the castle. It would be much more fun to visit them, she said. And now we come to Series 9, where it's all downhill in the writing department. Out of Emily's roles in this season, supporting or lead, they weren't that great. In Molly's special special, she was one of the engines who made fun of Molly just because she was pulling empty trucks. Sounds a bit childish and petty if you ask me. Then again, name the last time a new engine wasn't teased or made to look silly. In Thomas's milkshake model, she almost ruined Thomas's milk delivery run by taunting him over being slow, which caused him to make the mistake by going fast while delivering the milk churns which turned them into almost butter. However, Thomas then used his mistake to his advantage by delivering the now butter to the bakery, thus winning the fast controller's praises again. But remember, her involvement in that was unintentional. Sometimes, when engines get playful or competitive, they forget common sense. True, though I still blame her for provoking him into silly ideas yet again. And then we get the infamous Thomas and the New Engine, which nearly everyone in the episode's out of character, and Neville is almost a plot device rather than a character. Oh, and the steamy versus diesel conflict is present, presenting a racist-like undertones, which makes it even better. It's a pity, because I think Neville has a lot of potential that just wasn't tapped into. My only theory on that is that Diesel 10 or PT Boomer spiked the water towers with stupid pills, which thankfully wore off near the end of the episode. 
As far as we know, that episode could have just been a bad fanfic made by someone who had lots of time on their hands and very little creativity. While both sound plausible, I think the first idea would be the most believable, as Diaz on 10 likes to troll to steam engines, and Boomer was probably still miffed that he didn't get his spotlight in Thomas and the Magic Railroad. And finally, we have Emily Knows Best, with Emily losing most of her common sense and causing confusion and delay by thinking she knew best. In this episode, Emily decides that she wants to be a queen and give orders to Percy and Toby. Thankfully, though, it seems that she has somewhat learned from Series 8 and is being a bit nicer despite her bossiness, trying to lighten the queen role into more of a role play. I'd like to be a queen. But they all had the same answer. Engines don't go LARPing. Unfortunately, her idea of being queen causes Percy to crash into Mavis, and then causing Toby to derail. In an instant, Emily apologizes for her mess-up and asks Toby for advice on what to do next. I'm sure she's definitely learned a lot from Series 8. She's apologized for her mistake out of her own free will, unlike in Emily's adventure, where she only apologized after being told to by someone else, and she took that advice she was given very seriously. She does indeed prove she's capable from learning her mistakes and maturing a tad. Would have been nice if she'd been more mature than that in the first place, but fair is fair. And that, my friends, is the end of Series 9. <sighs> hey, are you feeling better now, Matt? A little. I just can't friggin' stand Emily in this era. Or stand this era at all. I'm afraid you'll have to get used to it since we're not done with it. Oh no. Please tell me we're not in. Yep, we're in Series 10. Feel free to sit this one out too if you'd like. No, I'll stay. I just needed a quick breather to unleash my bottled up feelings. You didn't beat up Mr. Tamlet again, did you? No way! Certainly not. And now, we're on to Series 10. Getting nervous? I know I am. We begin with Edward Strikes Out. SHIT! EDWARD STRIKES OUT?! Oh, hell no! Not that godforsaken episode! Now take it easy. We're not going to discuss it in full, since Edward is not the focus. Emily is. Oh, that's good. But I just remembered, she doesn't have a very big role in the episode, but she has an infamous line. I don't like being patient. Pouted Emily. We have a very important job to do. What was that? You say you don't like being patient? <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? Didn't you learn to be more patient back in As Good As Gordon? Even though you were mature enough in Series 7 to know your manners and be patient, all of a sudden, you don't like being patient? You god fucking damn bitch! How could you deliberately forget that lesson? And that is something we like to call continuity errors. <laughs> Matt, do I have to get Belle and Flynn again? And James, for goodness sake, don't roast marshmallows on his head. But I was hungry. Drop it, mister. Okay. Ah! Now allow me to shed some light on the situation. See, in that instance, Emily wasn't relapsing into her older impatience. The only reason she said this is because she didn't like how Edward refused to admit that a bigger crane was needed to clear up this miss. And she knew that Harvey, possibly from having a rather weak chain due to his usual one being in the shop, couldn't clean all those pipes up at once. It didn't mean she didn't like being patient. It just means that she didn't like having Edward be too out of character to admit they needed more help. Okay, maybe I see your point. But I still think she could have worded it better than that. I agree. Had the writers given us something wiser to say, or if Edward hadn't been so badly written to begin with, perhaps it wouldn't have been taken the wrong way. Next, we have Thomas and the Treasure, which is a later episode in the season, but we're going to cover it first. Once again, Emily has an unneeded antagonist role. Again, teasing an engine and telling them there's no treasure does not make one a villain. She was merely being uptight like Gordon and James, insisting that things like buried treasure and pirates were just made-up stories. But when the treasure is proven to be real, look at Emily's face. See that? This means that while Emily was acting like the others, thinking that Thomas was being silly for believing in very treasure, she was only pretending to be this way so she wouldn't be made fun of. And she was actually hoping Thomas would find the treasure and prove them wrong. Gee, James, you sure like trying to focus on alternative perspectives for Emily, don't ya? Are we trying to play favorites? I'm not playing favorites. It's just a habit of mine. 
While I understand that many people don't like episodes of characters that I like due to certain reasons, I usually try to look at how they each have their own good sides to them. Whether something is good or bad all depends on how you look at it. Take the episode Slice of Light from Friends of His Magic, for example. Oh, don't you even try to bring up that abysmal fanfiction with me, James. Indeed, that's how I see it. Series 5 has 25 episodes, or 23 if you count both two-parters as one episode each, and a fanfiction someone tried so hard to pass off as an episode, it shouldn't exist at all. And I respect your opinion on the matter. Many people, like you and Zack, hated it because it seemed to focus too much on the background characters and fandom memes while pushing out the main six. But to those who liked it, such as Matt here, it seemed like a fun way to learn more about other characters outside the main cast while giving the main six a break from the main spotlight. If it was with supporting characters that had a focused plot and ending wasn't so insulting, maybe I'd like it. But as it stands, I despise it. Though if you and Matt like it, fair enough. And like with Matt's hatred of Emily's hit persona in Forever and Ever, or even Zack's hatred of the great race, I won't try to change your opinion on that episode. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you think that, Jane. But we'll see just how long that optimism lasts. We have one more episode of the season to cover, and it's Emily and the Special Coaches. It's another horrible episode, and it has yet another infamous line said by Emily. Well, there's nothing special about smelly old diesels, pouted Emily. She says this to Diesel, literally for no reason. Once again, Emily was being a bitch, and the Steam vs. Diesel conflict rears its ugly head. All Diesel did, with a weak smile, is say Gordon isn't the only one who's special. Diesel might be no saint, but he was pretty innocent here until he was needlessly provoked by Emily. Well, in the context of the books, Emily's got a point. According to a friend of mine on DeviantArt, it's made very clear that Diesel's purpose was to be a plot device in Duck and the Diesel Engine and be used as a catalyst for the Steam Diesel rivalry for the rest of the series. Of course, that does not excuse how Emily behaves in the episode. Which brings us to the point where she provokes other engines into doing something incredibly stupid, causing them more confusion and delay again! And yet this time, she doesn't own up to her mistakes! And here I thought Gordon was notoriously the worst at doing just that. Well, James, time to see if you can keep your optimistic side of Emily's hit Sona and explain her perspective of this. Alrighty. True, provoking someone like that without them antagonizing you first is uncalled for. But there's one factor we have to remember here. This is Diesel we're talking about. Devious Diesel. True, it was wrong for Emily to say that about him, but if you had to put up with a bully who, more often than not, chose to give your friends grief, chances are you'd be very irritated and untrusting towards them too. I mean, look at all the trouble he caused up until that episode, and more often than not, when it seems he's learning a lesson, by the next appearance, he's right back to square one of deviousness. So in a way, Emily's distrust of him is slightly justified. Had Diesel just told her he broke a record too in the first place, perhaps Emily wouldn't have been so rude towards him. Why couldn't Diesel have been written in a more likable way like how you and Zack wrote him, Rachel? I guess the writers didn't have such an insight of his character. It's a real shame when they overlook great potential for character development like that. However, there is a small redeeming factor for Emily in the episode. She brings Diesel a new motor to replace his old one and apologizes to him. Best of all, just like an Emily knows best, sorta, she again does it out of her own free will instead of being made to do it like in Emily's adventure. She's definitely learned more sense, again sorta, realizing on her own what she can do to make things right instead of asking others what they would do. And with that, we're done with Series 10. Oh, thank God. But now, we have Series 11 to go through. Don't worry, Emily is a smidge better here. She'd better be. The episodes she appeared in Series 11 were mainly minor, but she had a starring role in the episode Emily's Rubbish. That episode also introduced Whiff. Emily is assigned to work with Whiff, and she gets teased by a couple of engines, embarrassing her to the point she tries fleeing from him. But then, when she encounters Spencer, whose line is blocked by the rubbish she was supposed to help with collect, realizing her mistake, Emily finds Whiff and apologizes for trying to ditch him. The two work together, and Emily accepts Whiff as a friend. Well, Matt, if you really hated how Emily acted in previous episodes, then you can think of this as some long-awaited karma. No comment. And that's all for Series 11. Next is Series 12, a transitional season from models to CGI animation. 
It's like they couldn't decide between models or CGI, and the coin they flipped got stuck on its side. The models were used, but CGI faces were superimposed onto the characters, with the clay faces only being used for characters in faraway shots. All humans and animals were CGI made. Emily doesn't really do very much in this season, but she has a major role in the episode Rosie's Funfair Special, and a starring role in Excellent Emily. We'll mainly focus on the latter one. It's said to be a superior version of Series 8's Emily's Adventure. What do you guys think? Is it a better version? Well, while Emily does act a bit overconfident in herself, at least she's not being mean about it or bossing others around. Instead of being forced to apologize for her actions, she generally appreciates it when Murdoch rescues her and chooses to learn from the mistake she made. And that's that for the model era. Series 7 was the only time Emily was great. Series 8 for 12, she was horrible. Now is the time for the full CGI era of the show, which is where things get very interesting. Good or bad, that's up to you to decide. <laughs> but Emily was having a great time now. <laughs> she was having so much fun. She cleared the tracks in no time. In the Nitrogen era, with a few exceptions like the special, Hero of the Rails, Emily was just as badly affected by the poor writing as everyone else was. So we won't go over most of the episodes because they're basically the same. Storytelling speaking, of course. What I will say, however, is Emily's persona from Series 7 began to creep back in despite the writing flaws throughout. With Hero of the Rails, Emily helps the other Steam Team members with saving slash restoring Hero, and flat out refuses to give Spencer any information even as he harasses her. And there's also one episode we'll discuss in full, and it's Series 13's A Blooming Mess, a real diamond in an era with nothing but shitty episodes. Out of the Nitrogen era, A Blooming Mess is usually seen as one of the better episodes. Not universally, but close enough. And we can see why. Emily was actually written pretty well, and got to share the spotlight with Mavis, who was one of the very few characters not to get butchered by the writing. Indeed. Mavis is still a bit naive and fiery, but she's incredibly sweet. I have a feeling the tightrope incident pushed her to being more mature. But with the end of the Nitrogen Era being Series 16, came a ray of sunshine, which is the Arc Era, starting with the special King of the Railway and Series 17. Characters were suddenly written more like their classic era incarnations. For the most part, the story writing became a lot better, and classic characters like Duck, Bill, Ben, Asset started making returns. Turns. The biggest ray of sunshine, however, is Emily herself. She finally returns to her former Series 7 glory. If you don't believe us, then watch the Series 17 episode No Snow for Thomas for proof. In fact, we're going to talk about it first. And from what's been said by the fans, it's a much more improved and likable version of Thomas, Emily, and the Snowplow, which I agree on without question. It's yet another Thomas hates his Snowplow story, but with some glaring differences. Difference number one, Thomas does have his Snowplow removed and hidden somewhere by tricking his driver and telling him it doesn't fit. The next day, the Fat Controller has no choice but to leave Thomas in the shed and have Emily clear the line. Thomas at first is glad to be stuck in the shed, but this is where reality rears its ugly head. He eventually gets extremely bored. And this leads to difference number two. Emily, meanwhile, is unhappy at first, making us think she'll be mean and bossy to the other engines. But her tune quickly changes, and she has a lot of fun plowing the line and seeing the children play in the snow. Later, she returns and tells Thomas that she has to take Annie and Clarabel out, as he isn't wearing a snowplow. Having enough of the cabin fever, Thomas ventures out to catch up to Emily and find a snowplow. Unfortunately, reality hits again as it starts snowing, and he gets stuck with no way out, making him regret his actions. And this is when Emily shows up. This also leads into difference number three. Emily is all smiles when she finds Thomas, revealing that she and the Fat Controller managed to find his snowplow, and the Fat Controller scolds Thomas for his trick and gives him the punishment of clearing the tracks for Emily the next day. So yeah, Thomas is glad to have his snowplow back, and this leads to the fourth and final difference. Thomas no longer has disdain for wearing a snowplow, and promises to wear it in every snowfall. And there we go. Emily is officially back to her series seven self for good. While Thomas, Emily, and the Snowplow is one of my most hated episodes of all, its remake, No Snow for Thomas, is one of my most favorite episodes. I personally think that No Snow for Thomas is Thomas, Emily, and the Snowplow done better. It's definitely a return to form with our favorite Sterling single. We now come to series 18. There are three episodes of notice with Emily as the focus. The first one is... <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks, Tamlet. But I was about to talk about Flatbeds of Fear. A.K.A. Railway Ghostbusters 2.0. Emily's part in that episode is the voice of reason for when Henry gets spooked by the so-called Flatbeds of Fear, only to get spooked herself at one point. He can't help but feel sorry for her. And with that, now we can talk about Duck and the Slip Coaches. While Emily plays no actual role in the episode, the reason I'm bringing it up is because of a running gag involving her. It's one where Emily attempts to get into Tidmouth's sheds, but they're already full, with Duck being one of the births. For the ending shot, Emily is about to get onto the turntable, but Henry gets there first, leaving Emily out in the cold, possibly to find another shed for the night again. Poor Emily. Wanna know my theory on that particular scene? Some of the writers were aware of the Duck and Emily war, and decided to either make a tribute to the Duck fans, or simply make fun of how silly they were for saying that Emily replaced Duck. Thankfully, this incident it never gets brought up again, and the two are now shown on friendly terms. But while they were on friendly terms, fans most certainly not. The running gag greatly divided the fandom, and regretfully, I was one who was on Emily's side and turned against Duck and Henry once upon a time. But that's in the past, seeing as Henry and especially Duck are back on my good side. Now we get to Emily's only starring role of Series 18. Emily saves the world. So she becomes a superhero now? Nice! Um... No. Rather, she is to deliver a big globe to the animal park. Unfortunately, the globe falls off the flatbed, leading Emily to try and get it back. I still think the superhero thing sounds more fun. If anything, Emily Saves the World appears to have begun a trend that some people seem to have a problem with in future seasons. Problem? Of what kind? Where Emily feels upset or inferior to the other engines. Or, basically, be happy with who you are. It's a plot point that gets reused in later seasons. Either Either way, the episode was good, and we have just one more thing to discuss before we move on to Series 19, and it's Tale of the Brave. Emily's role in the special is minor, but more than makes up for it by being the finest hour for her character. She was definitely turning into quite the lovable big sister figure, especially when she stood for Percy when the other engines, minus Thomas, were teasing him for seeing a monster. If the engines were in human form, can anyone else imagine Emily giving the poor lad a comforting hug? Aww, that would have been a heartwarming thing to see. Technically, something somewhat similar to that has happened once before. You know what I'm talking about, right, James? Oh yeah, I'd almost forgotten. It's from an old fanfic written by a friend of ours. So, where do we go now from here? Series 19, of course. Ah, right. And the episode we can begin is her small role at the start of Diesel's Ghostly Christmas, a parody of Charles Dickens' famous story, A Christmas Carol. That's the one, with Emily playing the role of the ghost of Jacob Marley. Hey, James, do you remember that short fanfic where we see how Emily agreed to go along with Thomas' plan to teach Diesel a lesson? I believe I do. It's where Emily is reluctant to help out, and Thomas feels bad for having to bring up the years she suffered, but comments that Emily is somewhat similar to Marley's ghost. And if you want to check out that fanfic, you can find it on fanfiction.net. It was written by Aaron Cultural 97 who also wrote Thomas and Emily's relationship. BTW, if you ask me, Emily, in the scene where she plays out her role as Jacob Marley's ghost, sounds a bit like Rosie at some points in the U.S. version. But that's just me. Now we get to the main Emily episode of Series 19, Best Engine Ever. Now that was the episode which brought out the very best in Emily once again. Not only does this episode have Emily as the starring role, but Caitlin, the streamlined engine, has also helped Emily bring out the best in her too, by saving her from a nasty accident when she became a runaway at a steep hill outside Ulfstead Castle. Now I can see why Zack seems to be fond of it. Makes me want to try a rewrite, but with Caitlin as an LMS coronation class alongside Connor. And in Sodor's Legend of the Lost Treasure, Emily only says a single word, and is mostly out of focus. Thomas! Now we have Series 20. But, to my surprise, Emily doesn't say or do very much in that season, either. Oh well, there's still the Great Race, where Emily takes part in the Great Railway Show as a representative of Sodor, alongside a few of the other engines, like James, Henry, Thomas, originally Percy, and Gordon, er, Shooting Star. Boy, doesn't she look beautiful here? Yeah. If only we could have had Thomas be this amazed with her as he was with Ashima's appearance. Would have been a massive tease for the Tommy shippers, like it was for the Tomishima shippers. Next we have... Have... Everything okay? Oh, peachy. We just have a damn weak season to cover! <sighs> 
At least there are two good Emily episodes in it. And let us delve into them, starting with Dowager Hat's Busy Day, a real treat for those who love seeing the Miller era being mocked and torn down. And the fact Emily helped her with figuring out what jobs the other engine should be doing. Now, when an engine does a better job as a controller than a human, it shows how machines can sometimes know more than we humans can. That is, unless you're Percy from the Green Controller. Should we be worried about a machine uprise like in Terminator? That's pure fiction, James. But what if we're fictional characters in a story for an alternate reality? Are you kidding me? Is there something wrong with being fictional characters, Rachel? Not that, Matt. It's about the next episode featuring Emily. Wait, are you talking about Emily in the middle? Yes, and it's an episode I hate for what the writers have done to Donald and Douglas. Oh, God. Not that train wreck of an episode. Uh, no pun intended. Uh-oh. I take it they assumed all siblings should have the arguing lifestyle that Bill and Ben do? That's just stupid! Donald and Douglas's relationship should be one of the strongest in the series. Donald smuggled Douglas over to Soto to save his life and risked his own life by having their numbers painted over. Yes, they do have occasional arguments, but they shouldn't have been having petty fights like a pair of toddlers. I understand your feelings, Rach, but we're talking about Emily's role in the episodes. I'll admit I initially liked the episode, but then I later found it pretty weak. However, after reading a genuinely honest review of it and giving it a rewatch, I actually like the episode again. I find Emily to be the best part of the episode. She helps out the Scottish twins and is initially tolerable towards their bickering, only reaching her limit with them after getting into an accident. That is why I prefer Donald and Douglas to act more like loyal brothers to each other rather than fighting each other like Bill and Ben always do. I know it's not relevant when talking about Emily, but it is worth mentioning since she was at the center of their constant squabble during the whole episode. Since you two and likely Zach as well hate the episode and Matt here likes it, can't we all just agree to disagree? <sighs> Fine. Right. Good. Let's move on. That's it for the arc era. Now we come to the final era of the overall CGI era of the show. Ah, oh, crap. Please don't let it be. I'm afraid so. It's big world, big adventures. <laughs> be fun! Series 22 to 24 were the last seasons of the show overall, removing many classic characters, removing Edward, Toby, and Henry from the main cast to make way for Nia and Rebecca, imagination spots being added in, and the show begins to focus on Thomas exploring various countries. There is also where Emily practically gets forgotten by the writers. It's sad, really. Here we have a great character like Emily, but she gets forgotten from the moment we're introduced to Nia and Rebecca, who is the lovable Twinkie. Yay! Steam Team should have engines 1 through 12, as well as Nia and Rebecca. Mainly Stanley, Ryan, and Rosie as well. That would have been a great concept to see, especially with Rosie being in the Steam Team. I would have loved for Stanley and Rosie both to be a part of the main cast, but alas, it didn't happen. It likely would have been just as good, if not better, to demolish the Steam Team concept. Anyway, Emily does nothing of note in Series 22, but does get a starring role in Series 23's Rangers of the Rail. Series 24 gives Emily two notable episodes, Emily's Best Friend and Emily to the Rescue, with the latter officially giving her her number. Now, here's a really important question. Why the hell was it Emily given her own number in the first place up until now? That's a riddle for the ages, and one we'll probably never solve seeing as Emily fell into the background after that episode. It also doesn't help that the Big World Big Adventures rebrand was a failure that led to the original show ending. It's a real shame, though. We can only hope that this show ending is nothing more than an indefinite break until they can put their act together. Don't bet on it. We already have a new show on the air, and it ain't prettier than shit. Tab it! Get rid of that image now! See what I mean? Oh my. Well, at least her new voice is very pretty. Not enough to convince me, but fair enough. What if Emily takes the Sodor Ranges instead, Nia? Then you'll have more time to do your other jobs, and maybe Emily will have an adventure on the way up to the Rangers' camp. <gasps> what do you think, Nia? I think it's a great idea. Yes! Now, here's a problem many fans, as well as some journalists, seem or claim to have. The issue of female representation on Sodor has been around since the days of the Railway series, when the engines were male and the coaches were female. Was it an issue after Emily was introduced, but before Nia and Rebecca debuted? Actually, there might be a different issue altogether starting with Series 5. The show's cast was simply too bloated by the time Series 21 had aired, meaning not every character, male or female, would get a chance to shine. 
time. Even when the issue of female representation was addressed, Emily was constantly left behind. Poor Em. She's just as important as everyone else. Well, speaking of female engines, Millie wasn't supposed to be our only female narrow gauge engine. According to Audrey himself, Skyloy was going to be our old girl of the Skyloy line. I think it would have been nice to have both Skyloy and Reness as girls, as both those names translate to Lake in the Woods and Divided Waterfall. In other words, nothing in those names means anything gender related. As an aside, Rusty was considered non binary in series 4 to 7, but a girl in two of the American dub episodes in series 9. They finally call him a boy in series 10, which was what the books had in the first place. I still think it would have been nice to see Rusty as a girl in the books, but as the TV series stands now, I just don't know why they didn't make him a boy in the first place. Maybe Brits wanted to add another female engine to the show, but hadn't created her own character yet. And since Rusty's more of a gender neutral name, perhaps she thought it would work. Oh, oh Emily, you're my hero. Emily was indeed a gal with lots of potential when she first debuted. Had she been handled properly on the show, perhaps she would have never gotten such a negative reputation with the fans in the earlier years before becoming more mixed in later years. Sure, Emily did have a huge mixture of good and bad roles within the series up until its finale, but I still believe that an engine who develops a sisterly figure to the other engines deserves better than the character treatment she received during the season 8 to 12 era and beyond. I'm just thankful that some episodes like No Snow for Thomas and Best Engine Ever did her justice and brought her character back to light again. That all said, her episodes did get a bit repetitive in later seasons. Emily Saves the World, Best Engine Ever and Range on the Rails all have her to want to have some fun due to being bored. All in all, Emily's a base-breaking character, the biggest one before the introduction of Nia and Rebecca, where they went on to become even bigger divisive characters than Emily ever was. Even as she got better in Series 17 onward, the stigma from Emily becoming a main character beginning in Series 8 and her change in persona would never truly leave her. Despite that and more, she definitely has a place in the hearts of many fans, and that includes all of us. I think we can all agree on one thing. There's no one quite like her. about that, old pal. Hey, um, are you guys still doing the review, or have you finished? Actually, we just finished with a little help from James. What's up, Mike? Something on your mind? Well, yeah, there was something I wanted to say earlier with regards to my retirement. I do have one more video planned before my retirement from reviewing, though it's not going to be on this channel. It'll be on my main channel. Ooh, what's it about? I won't say much about it right now, but I will say that it's a subject that is very personal to me. Probably the most personal retrospective I think I've ever shared on this platform. Well, we look forward to seeing it all the same. By the way, where is it? Uh... All right, man. You got all your hit Emily bashing out of you, or do me and old Spinky gotta finish it off? Keep that bat away from me, Zack. Zack, leave him be. Matt managed to behave himself in this review, aside from letting his anger slip out with the, um, hit era of Emily. So you mean I got this thing out for nothing? Look on the bright side, Zack. At least he didn't burn a hole in the ceiling again. We won't have to sloppily patch that hole. Excuse me? What do you mean sloppily? Are you saying I don't do a good job patching the holes I burn? Oh no, I'm saying that all ceiling holes should be sealed with oatmeal. Shut up, stupid! That wasn't my fault! The bags of instant mixing plaster got mixed up with someone else's bags at the store! Is that where I got Mr. Tablet asking where his oatmeal was? Honestly! You'd think store clerks would be more careful with what they give to their customers. I don't even want to know how that happened. So how did you guys manage this review? Pretty well, actually. James was a good help in it. While he disapproved of the negative rumors regarding Emily, he still tried to keep positive and looked at the ordeals from her perspective. Really? Why didn't we pick you up sooner? Well, I guess it's because at the time, you guys were already busy. And you five had already such a fun dynamic going on already. I didn't want to spoil it and feel like too much of an oddball. Don't say stuff like that. You've been close with us for a while now, and you fit right in. I do? 
Of course. It's great fun seeing all of us together. And besides, you have been a great help in making those sprites in the past, and especially that Emily audio drama we took part in years ago. Remember? You wrote a bulk of the script, I edited it and did most of the casting, and we all had a blast working on it. Oh yeah, those were great fun. Hate to interrupt, but I feel like we're out of time and this video has gone on for way longer than it should have. Seriously, we need to start thinking about shorter videos. Oh, and what's going to happen now? Tamlet will cut us off mid se well, damn, he did. Hey guys, it's Zach here again. I just wanted to use this opportunity to point out that everything you see on the Emotions Corner is 100% scripted and all in good fun. None of it is real, and our real life relationships are much closer than what you're seeing in our videos. Our thoughts and opinions, however, are actually closer to reality, and our reactions are greatly exaggerated for a comedic effect. While the Emotions Corner has always been a review series, it's also a series that's a loose parody of Inside Out. Now that we've cleared things up, I'll finish off by promising you that the next review will not take seven or eight months to be completed. Once again, I'm Zach Wanzer, and we shall see all of you next time.